your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Listen, before, before you tune me out with a, with a resurrection sermon that you've heard every year, I'm going to take a different path today. And I'm going to, I'm going to expound on, on an element of this Holy Week that, honestly, all my life I've never heard preached before. I had, had a gentleman right after service come up to me with tears in his eyes, and he said, he said, PG, I, I've never heard this element preached before. With tears in his eyes, he said, I'm so glad you did because... I did not realize how much Jesus identifies with where I am. The past few Sundays, I, I've, I've encouraged you and admonished you for everyone to bring one. And on Wednesday in our Bible study, we had a special prayer for the one that I was seeking to bring. And, and I made the statement in our Bible study, I said, leave me alone if he shows up. And you better guard yourself if he gets saved. Well, 9 o'clock service rolls around, and he rolls up in here. And by the end of that service, he had both hands lifted to receive Christ into his life. What can wash away? So my praise is a little amped up today. You might not be ready for me. Because one I've been waiting on. I, listen, we watch people bust up out of tombs being dead in their trespasses this morning. I, I want to preach to you from, from Matthew. Actually, it's not even Matthew 26, and it's not Matthew 27. It's the in-between. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read this passage, and, and then I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the front and, and begin to mess with it for a little bit. Listen to Matthew 26, verse 57. It's on your screen if you didn't bring your Bibles today. This is the Thursday night of Holy Week. Watch this. And those who laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, and, and where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and Peter sat in and sat with the servants to see the end. Verse 59. And now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to them, Do you, do, to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the, of the Father, the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Verse 65. And then the high priest tore his clothes, and he said, He spoke blasphemy. And what further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? Think. They answered and said, he's deserving of death, 67. And then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? It's the end of verse 20, chapter 26. Look at 27. And when morning came, all the chief priests and elders plotted against Jesus to put him to death, and they went and led him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. I want you to see something about Holy Week. If you'll throw that up there for me. Holy Week is an interesting week because we, we celebrated last Sunday, Palm Sunday, which is the triumphant in, entry of the King of Kings. And I want you to grasp this concept of what this week entailed for Jesus. He, he came in riding on a donkey. The master had need of them. And on Monday, he steps into the temple and he sees all of the exchange and all of the nonsense going on in church. And he begins to flip over tables and begins to cleanse and purify the temple. On Tuesday, he's sitting with disciples and other followers and he's teaching them parables and, and different atmospheres and different things going on, which is really him prophesying of what's going to happen in his death. As a matter of fact, in this Tuesday, he has told them that, that this temple will be destroyed and in three days I'm going to build it back together, speaking of him, the body of Christ. 
on Wednesday, they call it Spy Wednesday, because while Jesus was at Bethany being anointed with the woman with the alabaster box, Judas has in his heart, this is a complete waste of things uh, and money, and so he conspires with the Sanhedrin on Wednesday, and he says, you know what, I will be the one who persecutes, I will be the one who betrays him. On Monday, what's called Monday, Thursday, he's now sitting at the Last Supper. He's washing the disciples' feet. He's partaking in communion. He's showing him this stuff. And then he goes from the upper room, the Last Supper area, and he moves into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he begins to pray. The Bible says until his sweat turns into blood in agony. At the conclusion of this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is now being kissed by Judas, who the day before said, I will betray him. On Thursday, Thursday night he's being betrayed and now we see him being arrested brought to Caiaphas's house to be tried by the religious people on Friday he's tried by by Pontius Pilate then they send him to Herod then they send him back to Pontius Pilate and then we see him whipped and flogged all of this happens before noon and by noon they're crucifying him and within three hours he is dead and they're putting him in the tomb and so that Passover can happen at, at dusk at six o'clock on Saturday they call it Black Saturday because this is where he has gone down into hell to get the keys of death hell in the grave and and then Sunday, well, you know what happened on Sunday. It's the whole reason you and I are here today. He got up. Yeah. Now, this is what happened in the span of the week called Holy Week. But the transition from Thursday to Friday has always interested me. Because there is a span of hours between Thursday and Friday where he has been arrested and now he is being beat and spat upon that where did he go? He has been arrested, and he has been brought to trial by the high priest Caiaphas at Caiaphas' house. Underneath the house of Caiaphas, they begin to dig out and hewn out these major rocks, and they, they called them pits. They were, they were literally called living tombs. In other words, people who had been arrested were lowered 15 to 20 feet down into the ground, into these hewn out rocks, and they were laid in these, these tombs, these pits, that were full of solitary confinement. There was no light in there. There was no ability to climb. It was smooth, solid rock. And, and he was lowered by a rope all the way down into a pit. And this was the prison that he was locked in overnight until it was time to go to Pontius Pilate's on Friday morning to be tried and eventually crucified. For several hours, through the midnight hours of night Jesus was lowered into a pit today I want to preach to you on the subtitle of this series undignified love the subtitle of my message is the love pit the love pit father we thank you for your word today the grass withers and the flower fades but it is your word that remains your word is a lamp unto our feet, it is a light unto our path. You've exalted two things above all things, your name and your word. We've lifted up the name of Jesus in our worship. And now we display your word before you and your people. John 1, God, let this word take on flesh that we may live out what it is that you have decreed over us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Do not allow this word to return void, but accomplish that in which you are sending it to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody who loved the Lord said amen. See, we've never seen a time like this in, in our history. In 2019, we are in an unprecedented area, in an unprecedented season. Things we thought never would happen are now happening. There, there are things being done today in the earth. We are now living in a world who is grappling for answers. Climbing the mountains of problems and questions, we are looking for answers in this world. It's interesting to me that in the season where we're looking for these answers, grasping, grappling for answers underneath a mountain of problems, we are also in a season in 2019 where we are more educated than we've ever been in history.
We have more technology that is available to us than ever before in history. We have more public, both, both public and private um, um, places where we can go for help and for understanding and for knowledge and for inspiration than ever before. See, back days, years ago, the only place you could find inspiration and hope was in the church. And now we have such public and private places that you can literally go anywhere at any time throughout the world, no matter the time of day or the time of night, where you you can find someone that will inspire you and hold you to answers. You can Google search every question that you have to find an answer. You can watch television with 18,000 channels trying to find somebody that will inspire you to help you answer the questions that have, have, have built a mountain of problems and questions in our lives. And, and isn't it interesting? Technology is more advanced than ever before. And, and our, our ability to have public understanding and, and our public um, uh, civic, uh, civic services and, and all of these things, the, our, our prescriptions, we have more prescriptions, we have more medical medications than ever before in the history of the world yet we're still looking for answers a study just came out in light of how much technology how much education how much uh, public uh, help we have available to us that people now are dying earlier than they've ever died and people now are refusing to have children because they don't want their child to live in a world that they don't want to live in themselves isn't it interesting that we have more technology than we've ever had we have more education than we've ever had we have more inspiration available to us than we have ever had yet we're still dying and don't want to bring in another generation to live in the nonsense that we live in ourselves you see I'm convinced after 43 years of living that the answer I found as a young man is still the answer for every question today I believe that the answer that I found one day when I was lost and I heard a message I still believe that Jesus is still the answer I believe that the life changing sin erasing power of his resurrection has been availed to me by the precious cleansing of his blood my old is passed away and all things are made new again and it is the reason that I can live in a day of uncertainty and still be certain of this one thing. He who has begun a good work in me is faithful to complete it even against the day that I am. He's still the answer. He's still the answer. To all of life's problems, he's still the answer. We find Jesus being plotted against being mocked, being spit upon, being beaten, being open-handed slapped in the face. And that wasn't good enough for the religious people. They needed to make sure that he was confined and restricted so that they had, they, they had time to get him killed. This prison, this pit, was literally under the house of the highest religious leader of the day. Isn't it interesting that the darkness of the pit that was available to Jesus sat underneath the house of the religious leader? In the name of religion, they created incarceration. They created places for people to be constricted in the name of a liberating Lord. They hewned out rocks 15 to 20 feet down. This was a deep pit. It was a solitary pit. It was a stench-filled pit. It was an inescapable pit. And this is how he spent the night after he bled sweat and before he was to be scourged and crucified. They lowered him down into a pit. Now see, you need to understand this morning, he did not go to the pit. People who hated him got him there. In the name of religion, they lowered him beyond the surface to the depths of his despair. In the name of of a God who liberates they confined him and lowered him to the deep dark place of despair
people who hated him yet were religious lowered him there they took a rope and they put it around his waist his, his shoulders underneath his arms and they lowered him into a place where the only water was the feces and excrements of other prisoners that had come before him he sat 15 to 20 feet in a confined dark deep solitary place historians say that they called this place the living tomb because what they would do is they would take people who were still living and put them lower in a pit to know what death felt like before they died he lived the duration of the last night before he was to be crucified being lowered into a place called a living grave. It was a grave, but it was for living people, not for dead people. They wanted you to breathe. They wanted you to survive until the despair and the hopelessness set in that you were never going to get out, that you were never going to be free, that you were going to be claustrophobic in the, castic of this, in the casket of this rock. Historians tell us that the despair was so hopeless that people died in the living tomb from their own despair. The Bible tells us in Psalm 88, it says, O oh Lord God of my salvation, I cried out to you day and night. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles. And my life draws near to the grave. Watch this. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. You have laid me in the lowest pit. In darkness and in depths. Jesus was lowered into a pit. I remember two years ago when I walked into this place for the first time. My heart was literally pulled from my chest and my spirit man because it was filled with light but I felt the hopelessness of where I stood but you have to understand Jesus was not the first one to go into a pit the Bible tells us that Joseph because of the jealousies of his brothers they threw him into a pit we find out that religious people back in Daniel's day were so upset with his relationship with Jehovah God that they created a pit and filled it full of lions and they threw him in a den in a pit full of lions so that he would be consumed by his pit. But see, Joseph got out of the pit. Daniel got out of the pit. We find the prophet Jeremiah where he's being pulled and he's being ridiculed and he's being hated that they threw him into an empty well, into an empty water well that became the pit of his life. But how many of you know prophecy and praise will always bring you out of the pit? And I want you to know today that there's something about people of promise that have to deal in seasons that are pits full. They lowered Jesus into this solitary place, dark, isolated, inescapable. But he couldn't die there. He could not die there. See, I wonder how many of us are in our pits today. I, I wonder how many are in our pit today. Oh, we're living, but it's a living tomb. You see, these pits were intentionally dug out to trap and to hold. Somebody in your life set a trap for you, and now you feel restricted to the pain of what they caused. It was a cold place, it was a dark place, it was an inescapable place, but it was built for one purpose, to confine people in harm-filled places. It was built to create feelings of hopelessness and despair. The purpose of the pit was for living people to know what it's like to be dead, so that one day they would. See, 
Jesus did not create this pit for himself. Someone created it to hold him in. Some of us were lowered into the pit of our lives by a father who said you were not worth staying with. Some of us were lowered into the pit of our lives because of an abusive mother. Some of us, we see, we didn't get into the pit ourselves. We didn't want the pit ourselves. But because of abuse or abandonment or neglect, somewhere along the way, people who hated us begin to lower us into this place where we are not worthy. We shouldn't live. And it's one perpetual addiction and one perpetual problem and one perpetual hurt. And even when life seems to deal us a good hand, we squander it away because nobody wants to climb down into the despair of our pit. I know. I I know we take medication and, and I know there's places for medication but there's some of us that are medicating things because people have lowered us into a place we were never meant to be but I'm here today to tell you the good news is God went down to the pit so you know that he knows what the pit feels like I'm preaching to people this morning that have dealt with dark places. I, I'm talking about inescapable places. And about the time you feel like you're climbing yourself out is about the time where you feel yourself slide back down. And, and even when you begin to experience prosperity, you are wording, waiting for the proverbial shoe to drop. You're walking on proverbial eggshells waiting to fall back down into the pit again. But I'm here today to tell you, before you ever got to your pit, it doesn't matter who took you there. It doesn't matter who lowered you there Jesus has already been in the pit because he wanted you to know you will not experience a pit that he hadn't already been in he went to the living tomb see most of us see the cross but before he ever got to the cross he went to the pit He went to the dark place. He went to isolation. He went to the lonely place. He went to the place where the only thing that was moist was his own excrement. I'm being very blunt because I want you to recognize he knows what living in minutia is. This is why we have a high priest who understands the feelings of our infirmities. I don't want to serve God because I don't know if he can identify with me. Trust me, you do not have a pit lower than his. Pastor, he was a living, he was in the living tomb, the pit. Most people die there. Why did he not when he knew the cross was coming? You see, because the pit represents the private places of our lives. And he's not there to just redeem the private places. He's also there to redeem the public ones. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians, That in this way, he disarmed the rulers and principalities. And I love this. And he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. You see today, you have to understand, he got from the pit to the cross. How did he get to the cross? The real question is, how did he get out of the pit? Oh. They took a rope and they lowered him. And when they realized deep, dark, depressed places couldn't kill him, they took another rope and they lifted him. They lowered him to kill him and confine him. But when they realized being isolated was not the answer to his destruction, they began to lift him. The people who hated him began to lift him. 
The people who wanted him dead in the living tomb. When they realized the living tomb was not going to do it, they began to lift him. You see, Jesus could not die in a solitary place because his fi victory had to be on full display. You, you need to understand that the public display of Christ's victory was also the public display of Satan's defeat. You need to understand today that in order for him to get to the cross to publicly shame them, he had to get out of the tomb, out of the pit. And the only way to get out of the pit was to be lifted. And I hear what you're saying because John chapter 12 is tapping me on my shoulder. He said that if I be, I'm going to draw all men unto myself. You see, they made a huge mistake when they lowered him because they thought depression was going to kill him. But they did he could not be killed by depression. So in order for them to get him to the cross, somebody had to make a decision to... And the problem is, is when they lifted him, the prophetic promise that everybody who come up out of the pit is going to come up out with him because everywhere he is, we get to be. And when they lifted him out of his pit, what they did was provide a place for you and me to be lifted out of ours. He was lifted out of his so you and I could be lifted out of ours. But this pit, this living tomb, was not the only place he laid. When they crucified him, they took him and his body. And the Bible tells us in John 19 that they laid him in another tomb. He was lowered into the living tomb, but he was laid in the tomb of the dead. He was lowered down to one tomb, but he was laid in another tomb. He was lowered by the ones who hated him in the pit, but he was laid in the tomb by the ones who loved him. Haters lowered him. Lovers laid him. Haters wanted to take him down. Lovers wanted to lay him in rest. One was a tomb for the living, the love pit. The other was a tomb for the dead. But it didn't matter which one you put him in. Because he was never going to stay anyway. You see, love went into the pits so that you and I could come out of ours. I need to tell somebody in this room this morning who is dealing in the deep place, the solitary place, the inescapable place, the confining, restricting place, the place of hopelessness where you cannot see light, you cannot see daylight, and all you're doing is trying to medicate yourself to get through the day. I want you to hear me this morning. The pit ain't it. It is not over. It is not complete. It is not finished. This pit is not the end of your story. It is the initiation of what God is about to do. And I'm here today to tell you that some of you are coming out of the pit today because love is about to lift you out of your pit. The pit ain't it. The pit ain't it. Sir, ma'am, struggling with the despair of imposed dysfunction the pit ain't it this chapter is not closed the pit ain't it it's been interesting for me I've had two family funerals this week 
and I have spent the majority of my time surrounded by memorial services on Resurrection Week. I don't know how you are on Holy Week, but I get real excited on Palm Sunday. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is a crescendoing of sadness until I get to Good Friday and then I feel like I'm in a funeral. Saturday, there's a little bit of anticipation because Sunday's coming. Oh, you see it all over social media. Sunday's on the way. Sunday's on the way. And by the time I would get to Sunday, there would be something inside of me that said, man, here we are. As if the fight wasn't fixed from the beginning. This was the first year in all of my time with the Lord where when I got to Palm Sunday, it was on and popping. Monday, on and popping. Tuesday, on and popping. Wednesday, on and popping. Thursday, on and popping. I went even to Friday. I went, man, this is for my good Friday. The hardest day in his life was because it gave me the right to step into the newness of my life. So why am I going to be sad about what he did? For without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. I'm going to celebrate that today, Good Friday, is for my good Friday. On Saturday, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Oh, snap, sooky, sooky, here we go. Get me to Sunday. I'm sorry. Get me to Sunday. But instead of going through a depression in Friday, I realized something. That Friday wasn't the end of something. It was the start of something. He said, it is finished, but I'm just getting started. He brought us out of the pit because he first got out himself. Now, I've been surrounded by funerals this week, and I even took the time to go see my grandmother. My grandmother was raised in, as a Jehovah's Witness, and, and it was on her deathbed that I leaned down into her ear, and I just began to share with her tears in my face. She, she had had a stroke. She couldn't speak. She couldn't move. She was on her deathbed, and, and I was not the one Jesus should have used in my family. Oh, y'all so holy, you glow in the dark. Like if you had aligned my whole family up, you would have went, not it. Maybe, 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 probably. But you would have got to me and went, not it. He is not the one. Can we find another? But on my grandmother's deathbed, See, I lived her whole life. Every time she would come to visit from Texas, she would come in, and she was the only person in my life that cussed. So it was my assignment to get her to the place to where she would cuss every time she was around me because I never had people to cuss around me. And just in case you're wondering, I'm the kind of person who would make you want to cuss. I found out at the funeral yesterday from my uncle that the reason why he spent his whole life not liking me is because I nailed his shoes to his front porch one day. I was like 10. Y'all pray for me. Pray for me. I'm, on the, I'm not on the dark side anymore. Hallelujah. I stopped by my grandmother's funeral. I mean, grandmother's cemetery, the, the, the place where she was laid. Whispered in her ear on her deathbed. And I said, if you I prayed the sinner's prayer with her, and she couldn't speak, but hot tears began to fall out of her eyes. And this Jehovah's Witness found the witness of Jehovah. Right there on her deathbed. I stopped by her grave on Friday. I pulled in earlier that week on Monday, and I pulled in and I stopped at my grandfather's grave. I looked at my great-grandmother's grave this week as we buried my Uncle Jackie. And yesterday, we laid to rest my Aunt Debbie. I've been surrounded by graves all week long. But I realized something, y'all. The pit ain't it. The grave is not the final answer. There has been this thing about being in cemeteries knowing that love will lift me from the pit 
because he was lifted from his. I've had this song in me all week. I've had this song in me all week. Now, I'm going to go back to the old. Okay? I'm going to go back to the country. As a matter of fact, we might even grab a little Johnny Cash before this thing's over with. But I'm standing there, cemetery after cemetery after cemetery after cemetery. And I realize something. Ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Gonna get up out of the ground There ain't no Johnny Cash this morning. If I can make it out of my pit, I will make it out of my tomb. How I make it out of despair, how I make it out of hopeless, inescapable situations is I do not will myself there. I surrender myself so that love can lift me. See, Jesus walked out of his pit so that I can get out of mine. And Jesus walked out of his tomb so that one day I'm going to get out of mine. My pit is my prophecy of what my resurrection is going to be. And I want to tell somebody in this room today, there ain't no grave, there ain't no pit, there ain't no abuse. There, I know it ain't good English, but there ain't no depression, there ain't no poverty, there ain't no anxiety, there ain't no sickness, there ain't no cancer, there ain't no divorce, there ain't no molestation, there ain't no abandonment, there ain't no drug, there ain't no alcohol, there ain't no tobacco, there ain't no thing that can separate you from the love that has the power to lift you. Is there anybody grateful for the love of Jesus? Stand with me all over the room. Stand with me. This morning, I'm telling somebody the pit ain't it. The pit ain't it. It's not it. It's not over. This is not the final resting place for you. But God, He who has begun a good work in you is faithful for I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep what's been committed to him even against that day there ain't no grave gonna hold there ain't no grave Oh, oh y'all gonna take me somewhere. Say, there ain't no grave. Shame is 
to prison as cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber and has come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me from the ground. And love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no
They mocked him. They spit on him. They ridiculed him. They slandered him. They exposed him. They nailed him. They beat him. They pierced him. They wounded him. They bruised him. They laid chastisement of peace on him. They striked his back. But the one thing they could not do, y'all, was stop him. And because he could not be stopped, neither can I. Cancer can't stop us. Depression can't stop us. Anxiety can't stop us. Poverty can't stop us. Divorce can't stop us. Abuse can't stop us. Neglect can't stop us. Nothing because he could not be stopped. The good news is I can't eat. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Somebody's about to get lifted by love this morning. The love pit. Love is about to lift you. I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how hopeless it is. I don't care how much despair you've had to endure. Listen, you are here. Other people may have died, but you didn't. Other people may have been hindered, but you didn't. Other people may have been stopped, but you didn't. You're still standing. You're still here this morning. And as long as you're still here, you still got hope. And I'm telling you this morning, love is about to lift you. Love is about to lift you. Somebody who's been in the pit of, of perversion is about to get lifted this morning. Someone in the pit of their despair is about to get lifted this morning. Somebody's in the pit of their addiction. You're about to get, love is about to lift you this morning. You've been crushed under the weight of religion long enough. This is the season where love is about to lift you. That where you are, where Jesus is, you may be also. Love is about to lift you. You're in this room this morning. And you say, Pastor, I'm far from God. I'm far from God. I didn't ask you how many times you go to church a year. I didn't ask you if you're a tither. I didn't ask you if you serve in any area of a church. I didn't ask you how many times you read your Bible. I didn't ask you what kind of music you listen to. I didn't ask you if there's anybody that has your name on their membership role. What I want to know is are you far from God? Are you far from God? Are you far from God? Is the depth of your pit the distance between your master and you? Listen to me. Love is about to flood your pit. Love is about to flood that pit. Pastor, I'm far from God. And today, I choose Him. See, most of us will say, God, if you'll just choose me, He already chose you. That's why you're here today. The question is, will you deny yourself and choose Him? Well, Pastor, I got some things that I need to get right. Listen, you don't get clean and come to God. You come to God and He'll wash Well, there's some things I need to get right. Listen, you don't get right and come to God. You come to God and He'll make things right. It's not in your doing. It's in His. But you have to be yielded to receive it. This morning, five tombs of dead trespasses burst open in the first service. I'm coming after some graves in this room today. Somebody's been living among the tombs. The pit ain't it. The pit ain't it. This morning, Pastor, I'm far from God. And today, I'm choosing to let love lift me. 
I want you just to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me today. Today, that's me. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing. I'm choosing. I'm choosing to allow love to flood and lift me. Come on. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. If you're in this room, yes, sir, you got your hand. You can put it right back down. There's two. Yes, ma'am. There's three. You can put them right back down. There's four. Yes, ma'am. There's five right there. Yes, sir, I see you. Yes, sir, in the back. There's six. There's seven. Is there anybody else? Come on. Come on. This grave ain't it. The pit ain't it. The pit ain't it. The pit ain't it. There's seven. I'm looking for you. I don't feel the release yet. I don't feel the release yet. Oh! Fear is a liar. Fear is a liar. Shame is a prison. But love is a redeemer. <laughs> is there anyone else? I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. Wait five more seconds. The greatest decision. Yes, ma'am. I see your hand. There's eight. Come on. Come on. Those of you that pray with me, pray with me, pray with me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It ain't gonna hold you. It ain't gonna hold you. Here we go. Here we go. For the for the eight people that I know raised their hand. You're about to get lifted this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There's somebody in this room today. You say, Pastor, I'm saved, but I'm still stuck in my pit. I still feel the pit of my depression. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm still battling the pit of my depression. I love Jesus. But I fight hopelessness and despair so much. I'm telling you, love is about to lift. I, I, I can't even count the hands that are up in this moment. But I hear prophesied to you, love is about to lift. Love is about to lift. There is not a grave, there is not a tomb, and there is not a pit that can hold him. And this thing is not going to hold you any longer in Jesus' name. Let me get everybody resurrected first. Here we go. Those of you that raised your hand, listen. Here's what's going to happen. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, salvation comes. It requires my mouth because my mouth is the rudder for my life. That's why we have to speak it. But I cannot speak something that my heart is not in agreement with. It doesn't work. But when my heart and my words come into alignment... That's when salvation comes. That's why, thank you, Lord. I feel somebody saying, well, I've prayed this prayer before and nothing happened. It's because either you didn't believe it or you didn't say it. But when you speak it by faith and trust it in your heart, that's when things change. That salvation is going to take place this morning. Come on, nobody moving. Nobody moving in this moment. Nobody moving in this moment. It requires us to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. That's when salvation comes. In a minute, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm, a, I'm going to lead you in how to pray with your mouth. I cannot force your heart to come into alignment. You can say the words and nothing happen. But if your heart will align with what I'm going to lead you in. I'm Miracle, tomb opening, grave kicking, stone rolling kind of miracles will break out in this place. And this is so important for you that your brothers and sisters that are already in the faith, they're going to speak it with you. And listen to me. You're going to feel it in a minute. You're going to feel it. When we begin to pray, it's going to be kind of like, nah, you know, okay, okay. But as you begin to believe and believe and believe, there's going to be a crescendoing in this moment. And all of a sudden, you're going to feel yourself elevating. You're going to feel yourself going, wait a minute, this is going to work. Oh, my. Oh, I feel something. I, I feel something happening. It may be tingles. It may be goosebumps. It may be something that manifests physically or naturally. Listen, don't get caught up in all of that. He doesn't need any of that for it to work. What he needs is somebody that wants to be lifted, that is yielded. We're going to pray this prayer. 
Everybody in this room is going to pray this prayer. But those of you that raised your hand, the eight of you that raised your hand, and I just feel there's a few more of you that didn't raise your hand because of shame, you're going to pray this prayer. Boom, and God's going to do something miraculous in your life. Anybody ready to pray this morning? Come on, repeat after me. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I come to you right I now. I come to you right now. And I ask you to save me. And I ask you to save me. I ask you to lift me from my pit. I ask you to lift me from my pit. Lift me from my shame. Lift me from my shame. Lift me from my addiction. Lift me from my addiction. Lift me from my bondage. Lift me from my I bondage. ask you, Lord. I ask you, Come. Lord, come. And save me. And save me. I believe you came for me. I believe you came for me. And I believe you lived for me. And I believe you live and me. I believe you died for me and I believe you died and I me. believe you rose again for me and I believe you rose and again I believe for you're me. pursuing me even now and I believe you're pursuing me even now I believe you love me I believe you love me. I believe you chase after me I believe you chase after I believe me. you want me I believe you want so I confess so I confess I was a sinner I was a sinner but right now but right now by faith by faith I'm saved I'm saved by grace by grace I confess I confess that what lowered me that what lowered me into my pit into my pit will not keep me will not keep but me, your love but your love your passion your passion your pursuit your pursuit your zeal your is gonna lift me it's gonna lift beyond me, what I was beyond what I was into what you have declared me to be into what you have declared so I receive your love so now I receive your love by now, faith by faith in the name in the name of Jesus of Jesus the lifter the lifter and the lover and the lover of my soul of my soul I receive it. I receive in it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Somebody give God praise. Hallelujah. Oh, 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 oh. oh somebody give him praise. Yeah. Give him praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody just lift up those hands right here. Somebody just lift up those hands. Love lift them. Love lift them. Love lift them. There ain't no rain Gonna hold my body down Somebody needs to know what freedom feels like When I hear, when I hear, say When I hear that trumpet sound Oh, somebody's rising Gonna rise up from the ground Oh, there ain't no
Just slip up those hands right here. And just thank him for love. Thank him for love. Just thank him for love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. He died to redeem you on potential. Ah, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. sink in. That's all I'm doing. We're marinating in this moment. Tell him why. Somebody say, say. Father, we just thank you for your love today. Thank you that you went to the pit so I don't have to dwell there. Thank you for the cross so I don't have to die there. And we thank you for the tomb so we don't have to stay there. We thank you for your undignified love. We thank you for your undignified love. your heart to Christ this morning or you rededicated your life today. I've seen some of our ushers already kind of work in the crowd. I have a brochure for you. Listen, I'm not calling you to church. I'm calling you to Christ. Church can't save you, but Jesus can. Religion killed Jesus. But Jesus resurrected to liberate the church I have a little pamphlet for you and a Bible it's called the love book in this little pamphlet there's four steps I'm saved now what do I do see if you do not know what freedom feels like you need to find someone who's free 
and let them show you what freedom feels like. And when someone who's been incarcerated for a long time gets out, they get so uncomfortable in this newfound freedom that they will sabotage their freedom so they can go back in the confines of their safety in their incarceration. Listen to me. You owe it to yourself to know what freedom feels like. But this is who I am. You owe it to yourself to know what freedom feels like. This is the way I am. You owe it to yourself to know what freedom feels like. When sin becomes your identity, you are bound. You are no longer bound. You are dominated. You owe it to yourself to walk in freedom and then decide if you want to go back to bondage. What do I do next? Four easy steps. Four easy steps. And I want to walk with you along the way. The last thing, the worst thing I could ever do is give birth to orphans. God didn't save you here for you to figure it out on your own. There's something about having a tribe. And today, I'd love nothing more than help you walk through your freedom. This brochure will get you started, but it's going to take connection to get you free. And that's what I long for. It's my heart. But this may be my last shot with you, and I'm okay. I, I have to be okay with that. You will not stand before God one day and say, I didn't know. Your blood will not sit on my hands. You heard the gospel today. And I know it's not popular in church anymore. There are theologians teaching and doctorating new ministries to keep the blood and the redemption process out of the church. Not as long as I'm here. It's the only thing that makes the difference. I want to give you this brochure. Listen, if you're uncomfortable, you don't want to be embarrassed, our greeters, our ushers are going to be outside and they're going to be holding them up above their head. And if you just want, listen, if you just want, a, you know, a little deal, you know, something, something, you know, just want a little deal. Listen, while they got the hand lifted, just tap them on the shoulder, leg, and, and we'll make that, we'll make that transaction. Some of y'all got a testimony. That's why you're laughing. We'll make that drop because this is a high for the most high. Whatever it is, we'll be happy to do. But before you leave this place, I have a life verse I want to speak over your life. And it has carried me through the darkest of times to help me remember that the pit is not it even in my own life. We find it in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 11. And I bless you today with the word of the Lord. I speak this over your house. I speak this over your life. I speak this over your job. For those of you who are married, for those of you who have kids, for those of you that are single, for those of you that are grandparents, for those of you that are li whatever, whatever season of life you're in, I say according to Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 11 that the Lord, the God of your fathers, will increase you a thousand times more than what you are. And he fulfilled every promise that he has given you. We ask it in the name that lifted us from our pit, the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen.